Good afternoon, everybody. How are you feeling? End of the day. Let's bring some energy. Uh, that's going to be easy, and let me tell you why. Uh, I am incredibly uh, honored to be here. This is the second time speaking in beautiful Berlin, and uh, I'm always very challenged because if you don't speak first and you had the opportunity to interact with some of you, you realize how amazing everyone is. So the bar gets higher and higher the more interactions you have. So the pressure is on. Uh, also, I really wanted to bring value. So I've added loads of headlines and, and, and top level slides because I want to touch on all the points that I can. Uh, we probably won't go into details in many, but I invite you to stop me afterwards. I will uh, be around for a few hours. The flight is only at nine o'clock, so I'll take any question. And, and actually here is my way to give back to you. Uh, as uh, you're giving me the opportunity to be here talking to you. Uh, there's many of you, so I'm a bit reluctant, but I promise I would do it. So after today, uh, if you call up the office in Cambridge in England, uh, it will be on me, completely free of charge, a half an hour consultancy over the telephone, over your marketing effort. And you can quote me on that. That's my offer to you to say thank you. So, th thank you. Thank you very much. So. I am assuming you read all of that. This isn't about us, it's about you. So I'll skip all of that because you read it. I know you did. Uh, so I'm, talk I'm going to talk about six core principles or 20 uh, to succeed in digital marketing, right? Uh, and I'm going to use my friend Mario. Uh, Mario doesn't exist. And uh, in his defense, uh, I'm exaggerating slightly. But if we're true to ourselves, we should admit that there is a little bit of Mario in all of us at times. And let me explain what that means. Mario could be an e-commerce manager, or it could be a CMO, it could be a CEO or head of uh, SCM or SCA. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what Mario is. Mario has that objective, to acquire, to engage, and to retain customers, which is why we're here today, right? So, we can summarize that as Mario wants to grow. And, and many people want to grow in business. Many businesses want to grow. Uh, but I think I speak on behalf of everybody who's grown a business when I say that growing a business does require that we take some risk. Does require that we put in the hard work, yeah? Uh, the law of attraction is a beautiful thing, but you're not gonna get success by wishing it, right? You need to work and take some risks. So. Oh, that, that's actually a mistake. Mario doesn't believe that. Mario believes that technology is useless. Mario believes that uh, only desktop matters. Uh, Mario believes that you should ignore your audience. It's all about you. Mario believes that social is a waste of time. And he also believes that customers are all the same. So I'm telling Mario, listen, uh, I think you need to revisit uh, this philosophy. I don't think it's going to work out for you in life that way. Uh, look, we, we built clients, which is a piece of technology we have built, but there are many uh, technology solutions out there that can help you to do everything that Clarence does, or, or, or most of the things. Clarence does intelligent bidding, uh, feed-driven campaigns, so that you can uh, achieve 100% coverage in your catalog, where for some of the products, you wouldn't be able to invest the time because the volume is too little, but if you can automate, then you can do it. Uh, you can do modeling and forecasting. You can do deduping and attribution, and so on and so forth. Mario, you can really do interesting stuff with technology because this stat uh, is quite impactful. More than 73 million products uh, were disapproved only due to the feed being incorrect or broken, and that's in one quarter. I don't know what the average or the value of European uh, e-commerce is, but I, I would guess somewhere between 30 and 40 pounds. If you multiply 20 and 40 pounds by 73 million, that's a lot of millions left on the table just because the feed failed to deliver. Mario says, OK, OK, I get it. I look into a better solution. And I, I'm thinking to myself, OK, I'm winning this conversation. I'm convincing Mario to look into better solutions. 
And then, then I get a bit disheartened and I think, okay, well, whatever. So let's move on, Mario. Look, this is a case study. It's a piece of technology we have built to bid at the product level on Google Shopping. If you know Google Shopping, you can bid at the partition level, which means that you can't bid at the product level, which means that a product may be performing very well and yet getting a low bid because it's part of a partition. And at the same time, a product that doesn't convert well gets a higher bid when it doesn't deserve it. The only way around this without technology is by building hundreds of partitions, which in theory is possible, in practice is impossible, because it will be impossible to maintain. <clears throat> So we built a piece of technology. The development of this piece took six months, if I'm not wrong. But these are the results. We implemented it where the black bar is, and you could see the revenue doubling. And this is a retailer with more than five years' experience, and the account was very well established. So this isn't as a result of something else. This is directly impacted by this technology development. Another case study, we took the same feed and we use it to automate the creation of campaigns, to automate the creation of campaigns for long tail keywords. And this, this is a four day lap and this is the sales going up since we implemented it. So the good news is that when you invest time and money, then the results can come. Yes, sometimes you develop and you invest and results don't come. But if you don't invest, if you don't try, they will definitely not come. Look, Mario, this is Monday to Friday, Monday to Sunday, and this is the hours of the day. You can clearly see the green parts is where you convert, the red parts is where you don't convert. Now, if you bid manually, even if you just spend 20 or 30,000 pounds a month, which represents a small retailer, it's impossible to keep up with it. You'll be spending your time bidding. And if you spend your time managing the bids, who spends the time doing the strategy work? the ad copy work, all the clever work that can bring exponential results if you keep managing the bids. At the very least, we need to automate the bids. At the very, very least. Even if that means using the Google CPA tool, it doesn't matter. But if you bid them manually and you're spending more than five grand a month, you're wasting loads of time. By a raise of hands, honest, who doesn't have one of these? <laughs> So if this is your target market, Mario would say, oh, young kids don't buy from mobile. Now, I don't know what your experience is. My experience is that if you want to talk to a teenager, you need to do it through Snapchat, because face to face, they, they don't talk to you anymore. But if your target market is young adults, they also are mobile. They just use WhatsApp or email or Facebook, but they're on mobile most of the time. This is the interesting part. This is the one that excites me the most because this wasn't happening only six months ago. My mother, six months ago, didn't know what WhatsApp was. Now she sends me emojis. <laughs> yeah? The world is changing. We either change with it or we get left behind, Mario. And he is not taking it. But let's look at this. This is very interesting. In the last five years, food fall in stores fell by 57%. Yep. Snap, snap. Take pictures. I know, I know you want to. Yet, the average order value in store tripled. What does that tell you? Raise your hand. Anybody? Don't be shy. What does that tell you? One hundred percent. Research online and then go buy. So people spend time researching and then they pitch up in store. If you Mario. And the thing that mobile doesn't convert, you're missing out on the store visit. Now, is this good or bad? Good, raise of hand. Bad, stand up. Good or bad mobile? By a raise of hand. This is amazing. This is the best mobile experience I've ever had. In one screen, you can decide to buy for when, for women, for clothing, for gifts, for knitwear, for jeans. It's incredible. This is ASOS, by the way. Well done, ASOS. Good or bad? Raise of hand if it's bad. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, Zolando. <laughs> I, I looked for women's shoes. You can't even see the damn thing. Yeah? Look at this. Look at my hand. Can you try and click the X with this size then? 
<laughs> Good luck. Yeah? So if you Mario and you have a mobile site of this kind, it's very easy to say mobile doesn't work, isn't it? But is it the mobile traffic or is it the mobile experience? So what can you do? Be mobile. If you got to be mobile, be mobile. Yeah, use a user conversion, a, a, sorry, a, a conversion rate optimization agency, a user experience agency. If you got to be mobile, be mobile. And this is a piece of advice from somebody who still has lots to learn, but I've been in this industry for 20 years. Forget what you like. Ask your customers, what do they like? What do they find easy to use? Because what we like is often not what the customers want. Here's a little tool. Uh, isn't perfect, but it's a good start. If you go to testmysite.thinkwithgoogle.com and you type in your URL, it does a very quick analysis of your mobile site. It tells you whether it's quick enough. It tells you whether it's mobile friendly enough. That's a good start. It's not by any means the mecca of mobile, but it's a good start. Just out of interest, how many of you knew about this before? Good, I'm getting 70%, I love it, good. Because I really want to bring value, and if I tell you what you already know, then I'll kill myself. What can you do? Be there. So here is a quick example. Likely, the guys at CSC were very generous, because as you can see, they made very poor use of the extensions here. Yeah, for those who don't know, these are site extensions. They only have the titles. Had they included uh, click to call, and some description, they would have taken up the whole space. Yet, if you're not position one of two on mobile, you really don't exist above the fold. So if you have a product, if you have a mobile site that works and a product that converts well on mobile, you really ought to be it up if you want to be seen. So I asked Mario, Mario, what is your mobile strategy? You know what he said? You know what he said. <laughs> yeah? Forget all the uh, store visits, forget all the assisted conversions, we kill all the bids, but I want to grow. And here I begin to feel a bit like this. It's a tough conversation. And I begin to beg, oh man, come on. Mario, listen, how about this? L let's talk about social. Who does not have a social account of some kind by raise of hand? I thought so, yeah. So social is interesting because today, with Facebook, you can target people. So let's take me. So you know I'm married. You know my age. You know my interests. You know where I live. You know more or less my earnings. In fact, with the new Google from Beta, uh, with the new Beta from Google, you can soon target uh, uh, income levels as well, which is very interesting. Uh, so you know everything about me. And yet, 99% of the retailers I see, certainly Mario's, make the mistake to talk to you guys the same way on Facebook as they do on Instagram, as they do on Twitter. Yet, if you do a little exercise amongst yourself, go inside your mind and reflect. Last time you were on Facebook, what was your mindset? What were you doing? Messaging people, checking out events or birthdays. Last time you were on Twitter, was it the same mindset? Probably not. On Instagram? Probably not. So why should I talk to you the same way if you're on a different psychological journey? So here's somebody who does it well. Nike does it very well. Facebook. A good balance mix between pictures and banners, and you can go to the, uh, and buy the product, and conversation. So Facebook is to acquire and engage. Look what they do on Instagram. It's all about showing. So they show, they show, they show beautiful imagery, inspirational imagery, beautiful stuff. And that's what they do on Twitter, which is what you're meant to do on Twitter, which is to engage and interact with people. Makes it personal. It is really all about forgetting the people like this kid who really, really, really wants the blanket now. Anybody familiar with the AIDA model? AIDA model. Yeah, we'll talk about it in a moment. But basically, this is where people are ready to take action. This is when people are ready to buy. Everybody wants to sell to people who want to buy. True or true? True, right? So it's a very competitive landscape. Now, here's the thing. If I am brand A, 
and I sell shoes. Do you think I'm better off driving people from my side through generic searches, so shoes, or shoes from brand A? Clearly the latter, right? Because it costs less and because they want my brand. So it's about getting in people's head when they're still at that stage. Maybe in a couple of weeks, in a month, in six months, I may need a new blanket. And if we can get our brand in front of these people then, then when they are at this stage, they're more likely to think of us. So this is the AIDA model. Attention, interest, desire, action. And it's all about trying in some way to get the attention of little Charlie here when he's still thinking about maybe one day to when Charlie is ready to buy. Because the illusion that I bought my Nikes because I really wanted them, it's an illusion. The reality is that Nike has splattered their brand in front of me for so long with messages that resonate with me that probably my, my decision was influenced by that. So we use mobile, we use social, we use different channels and devices to get to cover the user journey. So what can you do? The, my invite is to have you seek to understand the path to purchase. And that's almost impossible, really. But as the moment you start paying attention to it and asking yourself intelligent questions about that, you begin to make educated guesses. Start looking at uh, assisted conversions from devices or channels. Start uh, running tests when you switch a device or a channel on and off and see if it has an influence elsewhere in the, in the, in the funnel. Uh, the, the, the goal is to give the right channel and the right device the right credit. Two, remarketing. Uh, remarketing list for search ads, uh, for those who don't know, is the ability to remarket somebody that has been on your site or that is your customer when they perform a Google search. Super important because people who are already your customers, people who bought before, they should absolutely be targeted with priority. If you sell shoes, and I bought shoes from you, and I do a generic search about more shoes that I want to buy, your competitors will be there. You should also be there, because I bought from you. I'm already qualified. So it's super important that you put your brand in front of me, because I'm a qualified customer. Basket abandoners. Uh, we pay for the traffic, they go through the funnel, for some reason they don't complete and they leave stuff in their basket, we should absolutely retarget those people when they do a relevant search. The same is with people who view the product, the specific product, we can represent that product, the exact same product using dynamic remarketing through the Google network but also on Facebook and so on. Uh, Last but not least, this, this really is up for debate, whether you should retarget people who visit the homepage and then bounce off. I am a believer you shouldn't, because it's a bit like somebody walking into your store, turning around and leaving. I have no reasons to believe that customer is more valuable. But certainly, it's, it's a good experiment to run. And the last point is to try and test with a cookie length. If remarketing is and paying off, try and shorten or broaden the cookie length. Maybe people need more time because what you sell has got a longer lead. Or maybe you're targeting too often, so reduce the frequency. So there are things you can try to affect the results from uh, remarketing. What else can you do to, uh, on social? The, the first one is to target lookalike audiences. If you have a, a, an audience of your customers, target people that are the same, similar to these people. Same age, same demographic, same likes and so on and so forth. You're more likely to succeed. Uh, also, I would strongly invite to treat uh, mobile and social as a top of the funnel channels. If you expect Social, and I'm talking to Mario, by the way. Mario, if you expect to treat social and mobile the same way that you treat search, where people are ready to buy now, then you're doomed to fail. They are more top of the funnel channels. When you try and get your brand in front of people who may be buying the product in a few weeks' time. Engage, don't just post, uh, very important, and it goes with being native. On Facebook, speak the Facebook language. On Instagram, speak the Instagram language. Very important because the mindset is different. And engage instead of just publishing stuff. So go on Instagram and 
see uh, other brands or other uh, users that are interest, of interest to you and comment and like their stuff. Start a conversation on, on Twitter, on Facebook. If people comment on your brand and, and talk about you, interact because that goes a long way, much more than just publishing. And then a little bit of housekeeping in terms of frequency. How frequent is too frequent? on each channel? That's a big question. So we're running a little bit of an experiment, and the, the, the numbers we came up with are three to six times a day on Twitter, depending on what you do, once or twice a day on Facebook, three times a week on LinkedIn, no weekends. Nobody gives a damn on what goes on on LinkedIn on the weekend. And on Instagram, I'd invite you to try stories at least once. Anybody who knows what stories is? Okay, there's loads of you who don't, so I'll just spend a little time. Stories is just the ability to send out a post, so a picture that sticks around to your users for 24 hours. So that when they open up uh, Instagram, the first thing they see is that. It's almost like a promoted post, and it stays there for 24 hours. That, that's a good way to test whether Instagram can bring you some value. Moving on, Mario. What do you think, Mario? I mean, guys, this is obviously exaggerated, right? But, you know, there are people who really think Mario-like, I promise you. And, and, and this is how it makes me feel. Doesn't it make you feel that way? If you want to grow, but you're not willing to work? Let's look at landing pages, Mario. This is a real search. Yeah, no Photoshop involved. Search for buy skinny jeans for men. Landed on a bunch of ads, as you expect. I landed here, yeah? This is on a desktop, tra you know, traditional desktop, not too small, not too big. I can't buy jeans on the first fold. There's now nowhere for me to buy. No, no, nowhere for me to see it, so I have to scroll. Same thing. This is scroll number two, remember? Yeah? Scroll number three. Slim fit. Okay, I want skinny jeans. Number four. Regular jeans. Imagine this. You walk into a store. Hi, I like some skinny jeans. Do you like some regular jeans? No, I like some skinny jeans. How about some slim fit jeans? I like some regular jeans. Oh, no, no, how about some slim? And how do you feel? Yeah? I, I, I want to go crazy. That was a paid ad. Somebody paid for a user who typed in skinny jeans, and then put them through that journey. When the bizarre thing is that this site had 19 skinny jeans available and a filter for it. All they had to do is to send these people to a filtered version of that page. Is that hard? No, it just takes a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking. Last, I'm almost done. Mario, talk to me about email marketing. And he says, I'm going to try and do Mario now. Okay. We have 150,000 people in the list. And I say, all right. So some bought jackets, some bought jeans, some bought shoes. Some bought one week ago, some bought one month ago, some bought one year ago. Some bought one-off purchase, some weekly, and some never bought. This is what Mario says. How would you feel if you were me? I don't swear much, but I have no choice. <laughs> what's interesting, guys, uh, what's interesting is that we used to be for a long time, I've been in marketing since I was 19 years old, the internet didn't exist, wasn't a thing. I was selling advertising on the Yellow Pages competitor. Competitor, they had 200,000 copies, we had 2,000. So competitor is a stretch. But it used to be the case that big versus small, the big would always win, yeah? You can never beat Nike, you can never beat all those big guys. But if you use creative thinking, resourcefulness rather than resources, and really try to be creative, things have changed. You know, things have really changed. We now have a chance to be really competing. Do you know who this guy is? Anybody? His name is Richard Bannister, and in, in 1954, he said he was going to break the, 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 uh, the mile, the record for the mile, and he would do it a sub-four minute. 
And they said it was crazy. They said it's a rule of biology. Your heart will explode. He ran the four minute mile. He did it. He broke the rules. So we need to be prepared to take some risks and break some rules if we want to achieve something special. And the main message for today is just don't be like Mario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do, we have time for a couple of questions. Hands in the air. Who has a question for Luca? Anyone? Here we go. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, native apps versus mobile websites? Uh, like, which trend is going to win or what's the current situation? Uh, mobile apps versus mobile websites. So it, it's an incredible question. For those who haven't heard, uh, the gentleman asked what my opinion is on uh, mobile apps versus mobile websites. Uh, it's an incredible question, and I think it's a, it's a question asked early enough. I think mobile apps will, I think, this is my opinion, it isn't based on any data, I think it will win. I think eventually all sites will promote the download of an app, because if you think about it, it's easier, not just for the retailer, but it's easier for me. If I have an app of a shop where I normally go, then I think I'll use that. However, Unless I'm a vivid customer of that shop, I probably wouldn't download the app. So I think for, generic, for general growth, I don't think that mobile apps will dominate, but for existing customers, absolutely. So also uh, regarding mobile, um, I think I, I completely love your presentation. There is just one fact that I didn't approve. So I'm, I'm neither working for Asus nor for Zalando, <laughs> but you made a comparison between two different systems. So you showed us uh, the mobile uh, version of the desktop compared to the, uh, to the mobile app. And I, I just opened Asus afterwards and I think the, uh, the difference is that they look the same. Yeah. Thank you. Now, it's very good. And uh, so the lady, for those who haven't heard, pointed out correctly that I showed an example where I showed the mobile app for ASOS and the mobile site for Zalando. So not a fair comparison. True. Uh, the reason why I showed it is because I'm not customer either, or I bought from both. And the, the app was presented to me by a paid search, uh, um, search as a download on my phone and Zalando wasn't. So the experience that I had, there was one click in between, you're right, but the experience that I had was directly the one from the app. So f for me, that did it, but you're totally right. So what I think Zalando should do then is to create uh, a very easy path to the app if they've got one in it. Yeah, good point, good spot. If you're looking for a job in Cambridge. <laughs> 